Hello everyone, I'm Brian. Welcome back. Let's go ahead and continue. Particularly this particular stone that you're seeing is the Guru Puja stone. When I went to Baalbek, which is uh, part of the Phoenician temple, which was built in… now in Lebanon. When I happened to visit this place about ten years ago, the moment I saw this uh, stone, which is the Guru Puja stone with uh, sixteen offerings, with uh, room for sixteen offerings. Even today when we do Guru Puja, it is called as Shoda Shopachara. That means uh, sixteen ways of uh, inviting a guru, sixteen ways of making it happen. This is a, a classic representation of Guru Puja stone, you will find an exact… Uh, exactly similar stone in Uttar Kashi, you will find these stones in… Ka, in Banaras, you will find these stones in southern India, in various temples. The triangle, the manifestation of the <coughs> stone in… Uh, in the way it is done is geometrically one hundred percent correct. This cannot be done by anybody others… other than somebody who is steeped in uh, yogic sciences. And uh, this must be about four thousand five hundred to five thousand years old in… intact, even today in Lebanon. Uh, Lebanese uh, children in their schools uh, study and they know from history that uh, Indian… Indian sculptors, Indian labor, Indian uh, elephants came to work on the Phoenician temples. Uh, if all these people went, if the labor went, the sculptors went and the elephants went, how would the yogis not be there? They would be the forerunners of this whole process. And uh, you will see in Balbek temple, there's another image uh, of uh, lotuses in the ceiling. Uh, obviously, this is a clear uh, uh, Indian uh, art sneaking into Phoenician temple because the sculptors from India, the first thing that they learn is uh, to make a lotus. It's the simplest manifestation of sculpting and they put it in the ceiling of these Phoenician temples almost four thousand to… four thousand five hundred to five thousand years ago. Uh, the people in that region would have definitely not seen a lotus because no such thing exists there but you will see lotuses hanging from the ceiling. This is a lotus inside Anahata symbol in the ceiling of uh, the Phoenician temple, the sun temple in Lebanon, which is called as Baalbek. This is uh, a fantastic uh, temple, it's a must-see for anybody. If you ever happen to be in that region, it is something that one must see. It is a phenomenal manifestation of human will as to how uh, and the inspiration that is taken from a divine contact, once somebody is touched by something of the beyond, uh, your own uh, earning of the bread or making your own name and fame doesn't arise, you want to create something that uh, manifests itself and functions beyond yourself. So these ancient temples are a manifestation of that. You see the symbol the yogic symbols of Anahata and the blossoming of the flower, it is… it is across the planet in many, many representations uh, in the form of sculpture. Once again, we must remember only that which was carved on stone and that which endured the ravages of time you see, but so much of it which is in practice will never be seen unless like that uh, skeletal representation where Someone died in a yogic <laughs> posture. If that happens only, maybe <laughs> there will be proof of uh, yoga in North America after ten thousand years. So these are all various symbolisms, I will not go into uh, this, this is Jordan. You can see a manifestation of the… the linga forms and the crescent moon and snakes. This is uh, very important, this is a three-headed bull. Before uh, the first one uh, is in Sumeria, but we have uh, these things in Indus Valley. 
whoever fixes these dates uh, on what basis, I do not know. We will go by that and uh, this is about five thousand years where three-headed bull… three-headed bull is a representation of the same uh, uh, process of the Ida, Pingala and the Shushumna, represented as a bull, later on evolved or uh, parallelly it also evolved into three-headed snake or three snakes, these three-headed bulls and uh, there are wonderful stories going back in many ways. Uh, for those of you who are familiar, or if you happen to attend uh, the Leela program about the way Krishna represented yoga, there's a beautiful story about Krishna taming the bull. There is a whole lot of uh, stories going back into history where this was… Uh, today it is being labeled as uh, bull jumping, where uh, people conquering the bull was uh, not only a uh, macho manifestation in a society, but it was also considered as a spiritual pursuit that if you conquer the bull within you, that means you conquer the, your animal nature, that is when you are delivered. So these two things are very much there in Krishna's life of uh, he taming a bull and then dancing upon the hood of a snake. So these two things are a symbolic uh, representation of how he tamed the animal nature within himself and arrived at a place where he's on top of a, a snake's hood, representing that he's reached. The snake has risen within him, so the man has risen. That is what uh, these two stories are trying to say. Here is a, a beautiful manifestation of uh, a linga and a yogic symbol of seven dimensions of life peeking out and uh, the human figure in between. These are different art forms trying to say the same thing. So this is from the Indus Valley, okay, this is in the Indian region. Here is a two thousand year old uh, Egyptian uh, snake with a crescent on top of it. And uh, here what you see is the snake which is the Lingabhairavi temple. This is uh, the symbol of infinity. They representing infinite nature or cosmic arousal of uh, energy, which is uh, which is also possible within an individual human being. So this is called as the arborist uh, in today's uh, language. Uh, this happened uh, a few years ago. I was uh, in conversation with a physicist, and <laughs> we had uh, six, seven hours of non-stop, uh, unbroken conversation. And uh, I was trying to demonstrate to him and uh, if you become meditative or if you get settled in a certain way within yourself, if you hold one's hand, uh, uh, let's say uh, nine to twelve inches above my head right now, you can clearly feel the energy moving in this… Uh, in this form. And I said, this is the… This is a dimension which represents you across the physical limitations. If you hold your hand on top of uh, anybody's head, please don't go about experimenting like this <laughs> and proving something about someone else. But uh, you will see the energy will always move this way. The moment it has hit this form, that means he's, he's crossed the physical limitations within himself. When I said this and crossing physical limitations also means moving from finite to infinite, it is on that day that I, uh, <laughs> you know, I logically connected. He said, the, this physicist told me that this is the symbol we use for the uh, expression of the infinite. I said, well, this is… this is from the yogic culture, only someone who has known this within himself could have used that. So the number system, the zero and the infinite, both came from the yogic culture. Today when you say shunya, which is the zero, uh, nobody could have thought of a zero except one who has experienced that uh, sense of emptiness and the vastness of emptiness. When we say emptiness, the word emptiness or nothingness naturally brings psychologically a negative connotation. 
But emptiness means limitlessness, nothingness means limitlessness, nothingness also means infinite nature. That can only be arrived at experientially, not logically, not by thought, but only by experience. So, it is not uh, an accident that both the zero and the infinite comes from the yogic basis and that has become the basis of all modern sciences today. Everything that you do <coughs> is between uh, zero and infinite, but crossing these two boundaries is what is considered ultimate yoga because true union happens only when you transcend the numbers. Numbers means finite nature, only when you cross this there is a, a true union, then only you can say something is in a state of yoga. This is a coiled snake, this is a thousand years ago. When you enter uh, Spanda Hall in the yoga center, uh, <laughs> we have a very similar representation. Uh, everybody has to walk over this because Spanda literally means uh, a state of uh, primordial energies. Today the same cultures are uh, very fearful and giving negative images of snakes, but the same cultures at a certain time worshipped snakes and because of a certain campaign, snake has become evil. But even that campaign uh, <coughs> is not uh, a complete uh, success because it contradicts itself. For example, if you take the story of Adam and Eve, uh, there was a dumb couple who did not know what to do and a snake arrived and it initiated life. Someone who initiates life upon this planet, it's up to you whether you call him the agent of the divine or call him the agent of the devil. If you are for life, you would definitely call him as the agent of the divine. If you are anti-life, then you would call him as the agent uh, of the devil. Here are our beautiful snakes, cascading snakes uh, at the entrance of Dhyanalinga temple. This is the Linga Bhairavi. Someday, maybe uh <laughs> when I stop uh, traveling around, when I sit down in place, the science behind this we can experientially manifest for those who are interested as to how uh, all sounds are uh, leading towards this, are rooted in this dimension. That is what the previous image was about. These are South American manifestations of uh, someone trying to build a rudimentary dhyanalinga <laughs> This is very interesting. Uh, geographically, today in the country that we call as Peru, it's called Chavin. This is a, a classic, uh, um, yeah, I will be uh, <laughs> to uh, what to say. <clears throat> it will be too arrogant for me to say it's a classic uh, reproduction of Dhyanalinga site. <laughs> Dhyanalinga is a classic reproduction of this one. We were not aware of this at that time, but now it's really fantastic to see exactly in a similar kind of magnetic and other kind of forces which work on the planet, someone tried to establish uh, a very similar uh, uh, setup of an energy center. This is the plan from the top but you will see so many things which are very similar. You will see uh, it's very, very similar in construction to the Dhyanalinga complex <coughs> in terms of uh, the plan, the way we uh, did the approaches as to how it should be to make it experientially possible for people who enter the temple. When we <coughs> built Dhyanalinga, we were not aware of these things, but today people have researched into these things and found out. Now, the Dhyangalinga, I'm wondering, is that the big one that Sadhguru did? I believe the one that he would only do ever one of. Is that the one he's talking about? Uh, I know he's done, like, the smaller ones, he says. I have not seen the smaller ones, I've seen the big one. 
I reacted to it on his channel, and this is the one thing that he said that he can only ever do one of. And as a matter of fact, this that's what his life work was about, I believe. That he re he kept reincarnating back into this life to complete this because it was was not the right time. Something wasn't done right. I can't remember. <clears throat> but now that it is done, he's completed his life work. Is this the same one? This is a. Uh seven snakes coming out of human beings had these are all rep yogic representations of the rising of the kundalini this is in south america a few thousand years ago this is a an art form of uh, a depiction of uh, somebody using a mudra like this and initiating someone these are uh, classic images of the Guru Shishya Parampariya in its own form in those cultures. This is a, I don't know if we can call it a pyramid, it's not a pyramid really. It's somewhere in Central America. So on the spring equinox it leaves uh, an image like a coil, I mean like a snake going up with seven forms of uh, bends going up. Only on that one day, it uh, happens. Uh, the equinox <coughs> is a tremendous possibility. Uh, in some way, they, the whole effort has been to create forms which will help a human <coughs> being to attain to his fullest form. So various times of uh, mechanisms were created. Uh, some are very sophisticated, some are rudimentary in nature but uh, the effort has been there all over the world. So here we are uh, today uh, uh, seeing the impact of uh, yogic systems across the planet. Whatever these images and stuff we're talking about is only what is left of in form of physical uh, things. But uh, the impact that would have happened for example, right now, uh, for most of you who are in North America or in the United States, for uh, a few thousand people who are doing Isha Yoga, let's say, or a few million people across the world who are doing Isha Yoga, let's say after ten thousand years, where is the proof that you did yoga? There may, there may be still a few stones left in Dhyanalinga, in case we build something in Tennessee, there may be a few stones left there. So somebody will say after ten thousand years, in two different places, somebody was do… seemed to be doing some yoga. But <laughs> a few millions people are doing and many other millions of people are doing different forms of yoga, all that will not be left. So similarly, when you see one image like this, there must have been a whole population or a generation of people or many generations of people doing this, otherwise the continuity of it for the last twenty thousand years uh, manifesting like this would not happen unless it was an active culture across the world and uh, which has been systematically wiped out in the last couple of thousand years for whatever reasons. There is lore in South America where they are talking about people from another wherever landed there some six, seven thousand years ago and suddenly tribes who were living without any uh, engineering capabilities, their uh, highest level of engineering was a, a, a leather tent which is called a tepee. From there suddenly they started building uh, constructions, stone constructions which have even lasted till today. Uh, which are masterpieces of engineering. So they say the gods came from elsewhere and taught them this in the lore, this is how it is. I want you to just imagine, six thousand years ago, if somebody came floating on an ocean, on whatever they floated upon, and landed in your land, suppose you were in Indiana and somebody came floating, Six thousand years ago, when you had not imagined anything beyond the land on which you exist, they definitely would look like gods who came from elsewhere. And uh, they brought in mathematics, they brought in engineering, geometry. 
and other dimensions and suddenly those who were living in tents suddenly started building constructions which are... which do not... you cannot... a uh, culture cannot evolve from uh, a rudimentary tent which is just put up with uh, a piece of leather and stick to a sophisticated construction in just a short span of time. It will take a whole lot of time for people to evolve that unless an input came from elsewhere. The suggestions that the input came from elsewhere, which uh, you can call it gods or uh, you can say they are Saptarishis or wherever they came from, yes, definitely they came from elsewhere. Everything suggests they could only come from the east and not from anywhere else. So you could assume if you wish, if it... Uh, if it assists uh, your uh, Indian ego, you can say, these people came from India. Not India now, <laughs> I mean India <laughs> So if it is... Uh, because uh, this would be very presumptuous to say, yes, this is Saptarishis, but a lot of things indicate it could be them. It would be very presumptuous for anybody to say, yes, this is so, because there is no such thing. But in my experience, within myself, I know these seven sages reached out to the whole world and because that was Adiyogi's intention and that's how they went and there are... there are more, uh, what to say, believable stories. Uh, at the time of Mahabharat, Arjuna decides to... See, we must understand this one thing, that if you go through the Indian lore, if you go as far back as five, six thousand years ago, very clearly they're talking about the planet being round. In fact, even today in the local languages in India, when we say geography, we say Bhugol. Bhugol means study of a globe. The very word is suggesting that the earth is round. So, this is not like uh, whatever a few hundred years ago Galileo invented that... Uh, discovered that uh, earth is round. For thousands of years we've been talking about it. You should see the descriptions in Mahabharat where when Vayu takes uh, Kunti Devi, he takes her across the world uh, and uh, for the first time she sees and realizes that the planet is round and she talks about it and she couldn't believe that actually you can go round and come back. So they're talking about Vayu as the god of winds who took her around. She realized that the planet is round. There are any number of things to suggest that people were traveling or people did travel to those parts of the world. And also if you go back further, eighteen thousand or twenty thousand BC, uh, during the Ice Age, largely these uh, continents were connected that people could have even walked across, not necessarily gone by... Uh, traveled by the sea, but they could have walked across because land masses was connected <coughs> one way or the other. So it is possible. If you look at the knowledge that suddenly they exhibited, we can say definitely it is so, but uh, we don't have exact proof to say it is so. That's loud. Yeah, and that, that one continent was... I believe was called Pangea. <clears throat> So it's pretty interesting. Um, definitely got to start looking up into the stores, the Mahabra Mahabharat and Bhagavad Gita, um, especially the story of uh, Arjuna and the Vishnu. I am terrible with names, <laughs> but uh, and I, Swami Taratmananda actually has a video series of that, and I, I was questioning whether I should start that or not. It's a very long, it's going to be a very long one. But anyways, yoga and ancient civilization across the world. Now, it's very believable to say that this could have been the time whenever Pangea existed, but I don't know if humans existed during those times, because traveling across the sea was very dangerous. But then again, <clears throat> during the Ice Age, 
um, would have been very possible because how else did uh, people come across to America, North America? And it was during the, the ice bridge, uh, I believe in Alaska and Siberia? Somewhere around there. They crossed that northern section to go from Russia, I believe, to uh, Alaska. Whenever it was the, during the ice age. So it's very possible for people to get across um, continent uh, across the continent, but you got to think of the amount of time it takes to cross the lands and stuff, especially having to s cross mountains, not knowing the path, no geography, and all of that. But anyways, it's pretty interesting to see um, the snakes. I will say that that's very much, in my opinion, I'm I'm very curious as to why many cultures have that and where the origins of that come from. Uh, I'll definitely have to uh, find a way to look that up on YouTube. But anyways, there's really not much I could really say here because obviously there's, this is just like a history channel, a lesson where you essentially just learn about things and and much about learning about things. I don't really talk too much. I don't really have much of an opinion because it's not really something that you really have an opinion of. It's more about listening. So I don't know if these are great reaction videos, obviously. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, again, nonetheless, though, like I, like I said about earlier, about if Adiyogi was, say, something along the lines of, like, uh, the movie uh, uh, Prometheus, um, again, where, you know, Adiyogi could very well have been an alien. Like, I think, um, as a matter of fact, the Adiyogi YouTube channel talked about the possibility that Adiyogi himself or uh, was an alien, came to Earth and maybe planted a seed of life, left, came back and to see how it was doing, and then the seven disciples... Oh god, I can't remember the word, it starts with a P again, the, the Rishis, the Rishis, good lord, I can't say the word, Rishis, um, are the disciples to spread the knowledge. Um, also, I don't know if those Rishis are the, the Rishi, man, I, I, I don't know why I struggle with that word. The Rishis are the same Rishis that uh, Swami Taramananda talks about. I'm curious about that. That's the reason, uh, in, in the last video, I wrote down that seven sages. I'm just wondering, um, I might ask the question to Swami Taramananda to see if he, whenever he talks about the Rishis, that he's talking about these seven sages that Adiyogi first talked to. So that'd be another video question for Swami Tadat Madanda. So anyways, that's my reaction to yoga and ancient civilization across the world. If you like my content, please consider subscribing, thumbs up, thumbs down, down below. Thanks for watching. I'll see you in the next vid.